Hey guys, it's me again, Sammy the Bull. Uh, we're doing a show today, and uh, uh, the guest is Ross Broda. Um, this is a guy who took care of Dominic Particoliano. Um, he was very close with him. He did artwork with him. Uh, he took care of him when he was on the lam for a very long time. He told him a lot of stories and a lot of things. And I knew Dominic very well. His uncle was Nino Gaggi. I was very friendly with Nino Gaggi. I knew a lot about Nino. We came right from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn together. We were in the same family. Um, I was an acting captain. He was a full-blown captain. Dominic was his nephew with him, and I know a lot of the stories. He's done work, the guy. So this is going to be, I think, a very interesting conversation. And uh, so we're going to hook up together, and I want to give this for your enjoyment and his audience's enjoyment. Um, he's been questioned on some of the things, so I can clear it up one way or another. And uh, so let's get, let's get going, Ross. Sounds good. Let's get into it, Sammy. Um, you took a look at my film, The Lynchpin of Bensonhurst? Yes, I did. It was done pretty good. I, I think it was done pretty good. I, my production company, I could have did it better, but it's, it's done pretty good. All right. Uh, what'd you like about it, man? I mean, uh, I'd love to hear your take on it, you know? Listen, I love what you did. You took care of a guy. You're a kind-hearted guy. You took care of him. You, you, you fed him, you, you clothed him, you took care of him, he lived with you for a while. Uh, you did artwork with him. Um, there's everything about it, about you, more than the, the film, but more about you. Um, I think you're a good guy, and I wanted to talk to you and, you know, about Dominic and about your whole situation, how, how it all came about. So I, I'm sure you're going to have a bunch of questions for me. And I may have a few questions for you as well. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate what you just said. And, um, you know, Dom was, uh, he was an interesting character because not only was he an artist and which is how I met him, but he was also a war vet, you know, um, right. which I had a lot of respect for. My dad was a Marine. Um, and Dom was also, as you know, an ex gangster, you know? So when I met him, and he started talking to me about his life and telling me his stories. I was obviously immediately intrigued. He was a bit fucked up at the time, a little bit down and out. He had a drinking problem. He was kind of on the outs with his girlfriend. And he initially had asked me to just stay at my crib for a couple of weeks till he got his shit together. Two weeks turned into three years. Wow. But during that time, as he, as, he, as he started to let me know who he was, we kind of made this contract together that I was going to help him uh, get his shit together, get back on his feet, give him a place to, to work, give him a place to live. And in turn, he was going to give me his life story and we were going to tell it in a way that had never been heard. Not just the stuff that he was indicted for, but the roots, where he grew up, his family, his father, Uncle Nino, the whole nine yards. So the film became this kind of confessional, right? Where he really lays his guts out right. and, and, and sort of was very vulnerable and explained how he ended up in that life and how ultimately he got all fucked up in that life. Um, and how he ended up in the witness protection program and on the land. Right. Right. And it's interesting. And I think that's why this show is going to be interesting is to find out, you know, all the details between you and me. So, um, you know, any questions you want to start asking me, you could ask me, but I, I think it was a you know, very good thing you did. And uh, he was a heavyweight, actually, it, it, by be, just by being Nino's uh, nephew. He did work, which raised his credentials and um, respect of people who knew. Uh, you know, one of the hits, the one with Vinnie Mook, I mean, I was around, we were part of he was part of the same crew I was with so we knew about when there was an attempt to kill him an explosion um, found out later that it was Dominic um, and he was in the military special forces which is uh, 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 everybody who knows the military it's a special group of guys who are trained to kill and um, 
He used a grenade, from what I understand, and he rigged the whole thing up. Now, how Vinnie Mook survived that is when he got in the car, he went to start it, but he never closed the door. So when the explosion took off, he was actually blown out and right. quite a bit out of the car. And that's what actually saved him. If the door was closed, it would, he would have got blown up into a million pieces. But the explosion pushed him right out. He got hurt a little bit, but um, he didn't die. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dom, you know, Dom actually told me he ended up getting blown out onto the fucking marquee and got all broken bones and shit and was fucked up. Then he went to California for a while to get away. He, yes, he did. he didn't know who was doing what. Then when he came back, what actually happened was Dom was at a party with Nino. It was a birthday party. Roy had seen him on 86th Street and said, hey, I just seen Vinnie Mook on 86th Street. Nino said, all right, boom, let's go get him. And then they all, you know, went over there and and and, and shot him over on 86th Street. Right. Dom, Dom got, went with uh, Nino. So, you know, yep. he, he did work uh, a number of times. So that explosion was him. That the actual murder of Vinny Mook was him, you know, and uh, we never knew when we were, when I was younger, we never knew where it came from or why. We found out later that v uh, Vinny Mook was a real tough guy with his hands, ex fighter, uh, yeah. real tough with uh, with his hands. I when I originally met Vinny Mook, there was my crew from the Rampers went to Bath Avenue. There was somebody, one of our guys was going to fight one of their guys, and he didn't want anybody to come into the schoolyard. I didn't, I wouldn't hear it. I was going to go into the schoolyard. He turned and threw a punch and hit me in the eye. I still got a scar on one side of my eye. We fought, just the other guys didn't fight. Me and him fought for about a half hour straight. Wow. And the, everybody who was there said they've never seen a fight like that in their life. We were killing each other. I was fucked up. And I went to the hospital to get stitches. I was, I was cut pretty good. And uh, when I went into the hospital, Vinnie Mook was in the hospital too. He well, went to the hospital. So both of us were hurt pretty bad. So I bumped into him in the hospital. I said, see, I sent you to the hospital. And he said, you, you're in the hospital too. I said, I already came here to visit you. <laughs> but I didn't. I came there to get stitches and shit. We were both fucked up. But we became very close friends from that point on. Because it wasn't even our fight. Right. It was guys who were with us and friends with us. And it went, wound up over there. So I knew Vinny Mook and his brother, Louis Bopp, a very close friend of mine, Arthur Bopp, his brothers. You know, they were Beth Avenue and our crew from 79th Street and New York Avenue basically hooked up and we were all together as one when uh -huh. this whole thing happened. But it, ha it happened that Vinnie Mook w made a play for some woman that he saw uh, on 86th Street in uh, outside a, a Jewish deli. Well, it was and Nino's wife. He, he, that was wound up being Nino's wife or sister-in-law, somebody like that. Yeah, yeah. And Nino got angry, and Vinnie Mook hit him. Yeah. And and knocked him down. And like I said, Vinnie was a, a beast, and that started his you know, obsession to kill him, look for him and kill him. And when Minnie Mook went on the lamb, when he got blown up, he got all healed up and he came back. And then that night at a party where, yeah, uh, Roy DeMeo saw him, Nino and, and Dom got healed. They, they got their weapons and they all went there and they sh shot and killed him. I believe it was on 20th Avenue in Brooklyn. Hmm. So, yeah. hey, Sammy, were you a boxer? Did you ever box? I did. I, I never boxed professionally. I never boxed. I used to go to Gleason's gym and I trained with some people and I boxed a little bit, mostly street fighting. Then I mm -hmm. boxed in the ring a little bit for a while. Yeah. Um, and I trained a little bit. Um, and I started boxing in the ring in the army, uh, you know, I would go in the army and when I was in the army and I would go into fights, you know, the sergeant, my sergeant wanted me to fight this guy's, you know, guy in his group and we would fight in the ring. It, but it was nothing professional. I boxed there. And when I got out, 
it, I started off that it was um, really for getting in shape. It's the best exercise in the world. So I would do all the exercises and I would train. I had a Spanish guy, a Mexican guy who would train me. He was an ex-fighter, a big name. I don't even remember his name anymore, but he was training me and working with me. And then sometimes I would fight in the gym for real. And then sometimes a couple of black guys, a guy with a big name, I can't think of him, um, he was fighting and he was going to fight somebody who was very short. And he told me one time, he says, Sammy, would you get in the ring with me? Just sparring, we're not going to hurt each other. I, I want to get a feel of somebody who can hit hard and is small so I can get used to who he was going to fight. Right. So I got in the ring, I fought with him. Guys looked at it. You know, this guy had a big name. Um, if I remember the name, I'll say it, but I don't remember it right now off the top of my head. And uh, so I, I boxed like that and I trained, but it was more for, you know, getting in shape, sparring, stuff like that. But yeah. I never went further. You know, I had a name in the mob. I didn't want to be, even try to be a professional fighter. I mean, I could have, but uh, I don't know how far I would have went, but I, I never had... Uh, you know, I was in the mob. I didn't want a name as a boxer. Yeah, but I you enjoyed remember the sport. Emil Griffith. Remember Emil Griffith? Yep. The yep. Boy? He trained me. I, I, I was over on Forty uh, Second Street, Times Square Gym, with him. Yeah, he was a yeah. beast. He was a beast with his hands. Yeah, he killed Benny Perrette. Killed yep. Benny Perrette. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know he was gay. It turned out he was gay. He yeah. was gay. He was gay. I mean, but... He admitted it first, which is why he went fucking nuts. But when yeah. I was in at his place, every Friday, he would get his paycheck, he'd get lit, and then he'd start talking about what happened, and he didn't mean to kill him, but he was calling him a, a maricon and all this stuff. And then later on, years right. later, I saw a documentary where he came out as gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was gay. I mean, I, I seen him in the drip. You know, I seen one day a guy said something about him being gay. He ripped and got in the ring with him. And then he mm -hmm. ripped this guy a fucking part. So one thing you didn't want to do is make fun of him as being gay. He'll get you, you a break you in half. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> no. you know, he was a great fighter. Yeah. But it didn't matter. He was gay. But I mean, if, you know, it was unusual at that time. You know, especially being in the ring and being a heavyweight fighter. Yeah. So it was a little unusual and guys would, you know, make, you know, a remark or something. But you better not make a remark to his face. <laughs> he would kill yeah. you. Getting back to Benson, Urs, I do have a question for you because I always found it interesting um, that Dominic, he used to say, you know, how Benson Hurst was this kind of hotbed for, for the mob, right? And... You know, when you talk about you guys, the gang you were in, and then all the gangsters that came out of Bensonhurst, and you talk about even like segue into the DeMeo crew and all those cats, you know, why do you think everybody was kind of condensed into one area? How did that happen? I, I really don't know, but there's a lot of big, big names. You know, Al, Al Capone was chased by uh, Frankie Yale. Frankie Yale was right out of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Um, there's a lot of big, big names. Joe Colombo came from there. Carmine Persico came from, I could go on and on and on. Really big names come from there. Even Paul Castellano lived there. Now, even Carlo Gambino had an apartment on Ocean Parkway. It's not Bensonhurst anymore. It's a different area, but it's really close to Bensonhurst. So everybody seemed to, it was, that, that neighborhood, I'm sure there was a lot of neighborhoods that had a lot of guys, but Seems like every family had guys in there, 86th Street, uh, the 19th Hole, Christy Tick, and all guys like that. I, I, matter of fact, when I was a kid, I saw Joe Bonanno himself walking out of a, a bar on, on 86th Street. I was in a pool room. Everybody's running to the window. I said, what, what happened? No, look, Joe Bonanno was there. He come out of a place. He had his fucking beautiful fedora, white overcoat with a white scarf. and that was right. The whole neighborhood was like that. It right. was mob infested for some reason. You couldn't go in a bar, an after hour club, uh, uh, anything without it was, you know, uh, connected in some way or another. Yeah. I found it interesting because from Dom's story, you know, Dom says he came from five generations of, of mafia, 
all the way back to Sicily coming over. They were always involved. So he he put it as the families that came over. It was already kind of part of that. But then he also explained it like one upmanship where like, you know, let's say like in Harlem, everybody was playing basketball. So everybody's competing to get better. But out there in Bensonhurst, it's like everybody was like robbing cars and doing crime and trying to be a gangster. And and that there was this kind of competitive nature. I don't know if you can attest to that or, or you felt that yourself. No, I agree. Listen, as a kid growing up, when I looked at these guys, I knew the names. I heard the names. I knew what was going on. I wasn't even part of it as a kid. I wasn't even part of the mafia. But I looked up to them like they were God. You know, it was like big, big, serious names. And it was like, like I said, looking at Joe Bonanno from a window in a pool room as a kid. It was like, oh, my God, this is like the top of the line, you know. Right. So growing up, I always had that, you know, we were, when we were the rampers, it was us against the world. We knew who the mafia was. We knew they were dangerous. Stay away from them. But we're not part of them. We, we wanted to be independent like we're the biggest thing in the world. We were nothing compared to them. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, I, I was always, uh, you know, interested in that. I uh, always heard about it. You know, hearing about, hey, they found Joe Blow in the car in the trunk. It was like, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, it was like, that was nothing. No, no big news. Right. Just another guy in the trunk. It didn't mean nothing. It got to that point. It was like being in the Wild West years ago. And one yeah. of the, you know, gunslingers all over the place. I mean, that's how it was. Bodies all over the place. Crimes, fights, sit downs. And uh, the mafia held that city really, really, Brooklyn, not the city, but the borough, very tight. They didn't want fucking lunatics, rapists, child molesters. You'd get killed in that neighborhood. And yeah. uh, if you did things like that, they didn't want the church touched. You couldn't rob the church. One time the church at St. Finbar's got robbed. They went crazy looking for them. They got the guys, they got the stuff back and gave it to the church. So they, it was that type of a thing. See, when yeah. I was growing up, my father, I walked down the block on my way to church and they pointed to the guys. I said, that, who are them guys? Everybody standing out, dressed up, playing dice in the street, cop car parked over there, talking to them. He said, they're bad guys. But they're our bad guys. Don't ever talk about them. Don't ever say anything. But they're our bad guys. And that stuck with me. Our bad guys. So if we had a problem, we would go to them. My father was close with this guy, Suvido. They were paisans. They came out of the same town in Sicily. So if my father had a problem, he was a legitimate guy. He would go to his paisan. And he'd tell, no, I got trouble with the union or I got trouble with this. They would take care of it. So right. I grew up with all of that, you know, knowledge and being uh, inquisitive about them and, uh, you know, seeing them all dressed up. They always had nice clothes, diamond pinky ring, beautiful broads around them all the time, nice cars. So it was a major interest growing up right. to me too. Well, what's, okay, so then it takes me to the next question, which, you know, I heard you say this once in an interview, which I thought was fascinating. You says, you said, John Gotti's was a double crosser. I was a master double crosser. Now that to me lent itself to what Dom and I used to talk about when he talked about Machiavelli and the Prince and the philosophy behind it. And I always questioned this. If you know that the concept is double cross and you know your best friend could end up killing you, and you know that behind the scenes, there's this kind of undercurrent. How do you still get yourself involved in a scenario with people like that and feel like you're in really a brotherhood? Well, you know, there's a couple of things you mentioned is that we were in a brotherhood. Now, I never double crossed my friends, my partners. I never did that. And we never did that to one another. Now, when we robbed, we robbed strangers. We robbed other people. We didn't double cross each other. We didn't do things like that. Now, there's rules in the mafia. If you break the rule, you die. So once you become a main member, you know what those rules are. You know what you signed up for. So if you break those fucking rules, yes, 
you're going to get killed maybe by your best friend because that's right. who they're going to use. People who are close to you to bring you right. in to kill you, to make the whole job easier. And that's the way it is. So if you break the rules, I'm your friend. But, but I'm not going to die because of you. You broke the rules. You do what you fucking want to do. Right. You knew you could die. So I think you, I, I didn't, I may have pulled the trigger, but I didn't make you die. You did that. You killed yourself. You committed suicide by what you did. That's the way I started to look at it. I think that's the way mafia looks at it. We have rules. When you break the rules and you get caught breaking the rules and it's enough to get you killed, then it's your time to go. You committed suicide, asshole. You did these things. Right. So basically what you're saying is like you, you felt comfortable within the parameters of the rules that you could be part of this brotherhood as long as everybody stuck to that agreement. Then you right. felt right. good with it. And that's what I said that I said that with Diane Sawyer. And I said yeah. that John and other people played checkers. I played chess. You double yeah. cross me. I'm going to fucking come at you whether I'm going to kill you or I'm going to double cross you. I wasn't, if I was on the street with John, I would have never cooperated. I would have killed him and went to trial. Right. But I wasn't on the street and I couldn't kill him. We were in jail. It was in, almost an impossibility. And, uh, and I, I had double crossed him. I gave up. Towards the, and I was in jail 11 months with him. I right. found out very early on the tapes that he double crossed me and even at one point was setting me up to kill me. There's even a part of a tape where he says, you know, Sammy has become so powerful, he can kill me and take over tomorrow. So he was concerned with this. And he had a jealousy and an envy and whatever the fuck his reason was. Uh, after 11 months, he told me, Sammy, the tapes sound bad. Makes you sound like a monster. I said that because I was blowing off steam. I know part of it ain't true. And I told him, yeah, on your steam, I'm about to do life. Right. And he says, well, I'm going to control all the lawyers and you're going to take the weight. In other words, the lawyers are going to come up and say, you heard the government's tapes. John is complaining about Sammy being greedy, killing all these people, doing all these things. It's not poor John. It's this animal, Sammy. Right. When he told me that in not so many words, um, actually in so many words, but when he told me that, I said, John, are you sure this is what you want to do? Yeah. He's not a rat, was never a rat, I'm never going to call him a rat, but it's a rat move. We're brothers, we're together. You're joining the, you're making it easy for the government to put me away? And, and then his answer was, Sammy, I have to. I'm the boss. The streets needs the boss. Now, I didn't answer that. I didn't say nothing to his face. But as I walked away, I said, fuck him. Fuck the mafia. I quit. It's your best friend betraying you. It's like your wife who you love with passion. She betrays you. It breaks your heart. It broke my fucking heart. I love the guy. And... I, I walked away. I thought I would probably be killed because I'm breaking a major rule. Yeah. And I didn't give a fuck. I, I, had, I was out. I mean, didn't you think, not for nothing, from where I'm standing, it, it seems like he was that fucking stupid to think he could think that you would just get thrown under the bus. He said it right to your face. Not, didn't and he and realize it's not that stupid. It's, what it is is he's a narcissist. Arrogance. When he, when he took over... He lost control of himself. He's right. signing fucking autographs. He's okay. dressing back then in a $2,000 Brioni suit, a $200 fucking hand-painted tie, a fucking five-carat fucking diamond pinky ring. And he's dressing up for the media every day and flashing it. What the fuck are you doing, bro? What happened to you? Right, he got delusional. He got delusional, he and he, I, I mean, he really, I think he thought he was a fucking actor or he's a superstar. I remember being in the club with 30 guys, some guys who hear this who remember this. He says, oh, everybody quiet. The news guy says, right after this commercial, there's a story about John Gotti. Watch, watch this. 30 guys in the fucking club, everybody around the television. 
And then the news guy tells some bullshit story about him, the Teflon Don or whatever the fuck it is. And uh, everybody's like fucking puppies. Oh, John, you look great. You look good. You look great. I even said that too. But you know what I felt? I felt when I looked at that, we're dead. Right. You can't do this to the media and the government on every fucking angle. Right. Secret you know, society. What it's happened? a secret society, so the secret is gone. Right. What about Amor Amorto? Amorto isn't just you saying it, it's how you act and what you do. Carlo Gambino wore a simple fucking $30, I'm exaggerating, a $30 suit. Right. With a little fucking hat, like a little old man, no flash, no conversation, no nothing. No nothing. Everything yeah. he does was very secret. This was a whole nother fucking thing. It was insane. So I think that's what it was. It's not that he was stupid. He thought he could walk on water. I rigged cases and that came out from people who cooperated. Even some of the people who got convicted said, yeah, this is what I did. Sammy gave me money, blah, 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 blah. So I rigged cases for him. That's how he beat some of these trials. So now, and in that same time in prison, he says, I'm going to show you how to beat cases. You're going to show me. I'm, I'm threatening people, bribing people. You're going to show me how to. I'm, I'm the one who's keeping you out of jail. You're going to show me. By being public, he thought that they can never find him guilty because the public loves him. The public loves your ass. They don't love us. They tolerate us. They may like us. But when you get caught for certain crimes, his tapes buried him. They didn't even need me as a witness. He admitted to crimes over and over on those tapes. The only thing is he included me in those tapes. And poor Frankie uh, Lacasio. Lacasio is just listening to him. He's not even agreeing with him on those tapes. So, you know, he, and, and, and all of that, after 11 months of horrible, the, I've been in the jail over 22 years of my life. It was the worst 11 months I had in prison. Being with him. Being with him. It was insanity. There's a, there's a hundred stories. I'm going to do a scripted show. All them, shows are going to, all them stories are going to be in there. Uh, it was the yeah. worst time I've done. There was times wow. when the, the, the God would come because they separate us on different areas. Um, yeah. Sammy, there's a, a visit, a lawyer's visit. Yeah, yeah, listen, tell him I don't feel, tell him I'm sick. I didn't even want to go to the fucking meetings with him no more. I didn't even care about fighting the case anymore. Mm. It, it completely broke my heart to hear those tapes and what happened. It took the wind out of me, I'll be honest with you. It took the fucking wind out of me. It took the fight out of me. Wow. And, I, and when he told me that to my face, it brought the fight back. And my only way wow. to fight back was to quit. Fuck you, I'm going in another direction. You want to play this game? We can both play this game. And I did. And, and you get the label. I knew I was going to get a label. You rat, you this, you that. I knew that would happen. Yeah. And I didn't care no more. Yeah. I didn't care about my life, my, my name, nothing anymore. Right. So. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Because you seem like a ride or die type of guy. And I, I, I could bet a hundred thousand times over that if he didn't do that, you would have fucking. Listen, I had know, a double murder case and I, I was facing double murders and I, I never flipped. I was yeah. asked a thousand times. I was pinched all my fucking life. And I, every time I was pinched, they knew I was around people. And they always asked me, you want to cooperate? Get the fuck out of here, I told them. Right. So even my daughter, my daughter, I told her, you know, and it broke her heart when I told her I was going to cooperate. And she tells it in interviews. She says, this is something he's always told. When she said that her brother, her brother did this. Shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear it. You're like ratting on your brother. I don't want to hear it. I brought right. my kids up like that, my family like that, my friends like that. Sure. I hated that, the people who did that. I didn't hate them all the time because what I did is I always listened to, especially if a tough guy ratted, I would say, why? 
Why did he rat? He's not afraid of doing time. Why did he rat? What's is what's the hidden story? I want to hear the hidden story before yeah. I label the guy or whatever. I do time with a guy, Fat Cat Nichols, a black guy, tough yeah. bastard, and he cooperated. But when you hear the story, I, I don't blame him. Well, how did you feel about Dom when he flipped? Did you blame him? What did you think of his story? No, I didn't know the story. I didn't know what happened. I know he's his nephew, and I know he did the work. I know he was loyal to Dominic and to the family. And uh, I know he wasn't happy being a go-between guy between uh, Roy DeMeo. Mm-hmm. I think he was a little leery of that crew. He wasn't too happy about going there, I don't think. Uh, but I didn't know his story. I didn't know what happened. I never heard it. Hearing it, you know, from you actually yep. is part of what I didn't know. I know oh. a lot about him and I know about the things he's done, why he cooperated. I learned that more from you than anybody else. I, I never knew his story. I knew he was a tough guy and I knew there was a story. The guy didn't, listen, when you go to, in the army and you go to special forces and you're killing people and you're in a war zone. These people are not cowards. He didn't flip because he's a coward. He was a man's man. So whatever he yeah. flipped, I never knew the actual reason, but I'm sure there's a story to it. Yeah. Because no, I mean, he's the story not the type. His, his, uncle, his uncle, you know, couldn't control him. And when Dominic had this beef with this guy, Matty Rega, who owed Nino some money and tried to put it on Dom that Dom got involved and took a payment and didn't give it to his uncle. And he made up some bullshit story. Dom took off to fucking California and he made his uncle look bad. He made his uncle look weak. He embarrassed him, etc. When Dom came back and got popped and was in MCC, he knew that Nino was fucking had to save face somehow. And he knew he had gone against Nino. Nino found out he had this hole in the wall gang. He was selling drugs. He had his own little crew put together. And it came down through a guy named Gene Green, who was Nicky Barnes's lieutenant that Dom knew and done some business with, said, hey, man, we caught word. They're going to take you out. You know, you want us to help you out, get involved, blah, blah, blah. And then Dom went back to his cell and thought about it and says, you know what? Fuck this. I'm not... I haven't said a word yet, but I'm not going to get taken out here in prison because they think I'm going to fucking talk. And he knew Nino was not going to forgive him. And that's what ultimately caused him to flip. He just said, fuck it. That that, that makes sense. Nino was a no nonsense guy. He's a tough guy. And he, he, he killed when he had to kill. He killed. Listen, he headed one of the most dangerous crews, the DeMeo crew. He was the captain. And uh, so I'm sure if Nino had, you know, didn't like what Dom did or embarrassed him, he, he wouldn't even hesitate to kill him. Just because yeah. he's his nephew, that wouldn't stop him. He was that ruthless, right? I mean, Nino, yes. I heard, was one of the most dangerous captain. Yeah, he was ruthless, yes. He was. I don't think he was all that tough, maybe, with his hands, but he was dangerous. So right. when you're talking about a dangerous guy, fuck your hands. This guy's going to use a gun or whatever. He's going to take yeah. you out. And he's got a crew. All he's got to do is turn to Roy and say, Roy, take uh, my nephew's going to come down. Get rid of him. That, that's all he had to do, period. And that would be the end of Dom. And Dom said that Nino was the type of captain that he didn't ask people to go do work. He'd go do work with them. Yes. He'd go the hit. Yes, that's what I'm saying. He wasn't tough with his hands, but with a gun, he'd, he'd come right with you. Right. Yeah, and he was a tough guy. Yeah, no doubt about it, he was a tough guy. I actually liked him. Yeah. I got along very well with him, yeah. Maybe we're the same way uh, a little bit. I mean, I don't think I was as ruthless as him, but he was a tough guy. No no, no question about it. He, I, he, I, he wouldn't hesitate to shoot himself. He don't, he don't need nobody. Dominic told me this story like this. Roy, uh, um, fucking Nino gets into a shootout on, on the Belt Parkway, right? And he gets, he, he, he catches, something happened where it was a fucking bullet got lodged in his neck or some shit like this. And Dominic had to do something where he had to get the gun and he had to shoot a bullet into a barrel, he told me, retrieve the bullet 
and then switch it out with Nino in the hospital. Something to that effect. And I don't remember the exact details. Maybe you heard the story as well, but it had to do with Nino. <coughs> And, yeah, and let, me, let me tell you what happened in that story. Yeah. Um, Roy had, there was a guy, I forget his name, he was a captain in the family, and Roy was going, uh, Nino was going to kill him. And the guy, they were, said they were going to go to a meeting. Um, Roy, uh, Nino sat in the back with the guy who was going to get killed and another made guy who wasn't going to kill, be, and be part of this, and he wasn't going to get killed. And the guy who was going to get killed, his son was driving the car. And they were going to pick up Roy. So they, three, four of them sitting in the car. They pull up, the son parks the car on the side, and Roy is standing there. Roy opens up the door, and he sticks a gun and shoots the son right in the head. And he turns, the two guys go to move. Roy, uh, Nino, puts his arms, his elbows into both of them and holds them back. So he shoots the guy he's supposed to kill, the captain. And Nino tells the other guy, this wasn't meant for you. You can get the fuck out of the car and go. So they both get out of the car. Roy takes the gun and runs. He goes by a sewer, throws the gun in the sewer. And uh, while the two of them are going, there's a cop, ex-cop, well, not a, really a cop. He was a guard, a security guard or something. And he hears and sees part of this. So he pulls out a gun and he starts shooting at Nino. Nino gets hit in the neck. Nino returns fire. The guy goes down. The other guy takes Nino's gun and takes off. He, he don't get caught. Nino gets caught. And while he's in the hospital, Nino said, I didn't shoot nobody. I got shot. I was in a car, and a guy came in and shot us. It was a hit. So the son is dead. The captain is dead in the car. Makes sense. He's saying he got shot by the shooter and ran away. Roy DeMeo, I think, he might have been Dominic too, went in the sewer, retrieved the gun that did the actual shooting, Took a bullet out of it, mm -hmm. went to the hospital. Roy had a connection, somebody in the hospital he knew. They cut Nino's neck open, took the bullet from the guard or the cop out, stuck that one in, yeah. and took off. Yeah. So now the, the hospital comes, opens the neck, takes the bullet out, and keeps it for evidence. Yeah. On the trial... Nino tells his version with the lawyer. The cop said, tells his version. No, he shot at me, I shot him. So they get the bullet and the ballistics shows that it's the same bullet coming out of the same gun that killed the two guys in the car and that was in his neck. He got out of the fucking car and was running. They beat right. the case. Yeah. So that's the way it came down. Now, it was, a, it was unbelievable. To, it's a masterpiece. You know, it, it's it's a, it's a mission impossible. Yeah. I think Roy was getting away and maybe Dominic called. I don't think Dominic was there. He no, made it went got the call to get now I remember it. He got the call to get the gun where it was in the sewer and he had to shoot it into a barrel of water because they needed the the right Yeah, they gun. needed to shoot it. Right. Yeah, they needed to shoot it. They couldn't just stick it in his neck. No, right. Have, so uh, they shot it into the barrel of water. It's yeah. used they took it out and they stuck it in his neck. They devised it between Roy and him. Yes, that's exactly what happened. So, and it came back and it was, and Nino was in trouble for that hit because Paul didn't want him to kill this captain. Uh. There was talk about it and Roy, 
uh, Nino asked for permission to kill him. So Paul had told him, no. Let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. And he, while he was thinking about it, Nino did it. Got it. And this whole thing happened. So Nino was on the burn a little bit from that. Paul was fuming because I don't mm. think he was ever going to give him permission to shoot the guy. And then his kid, too. His kid was a street guy going to get made. He wasn't made. But uh, still, he wasn't made. You know, it's his kid. He didn't really need to kill this guy. But, you know, Nino and, and Roy, that was them. You know, they were, they were machines. Yeah. When they wrote, they wrote a book or something, The Murder Machine. Yeah. It was a perfect title for him. Yeah, right. It was a perfect title for him. I mean, he was, you know, but that that was, you know, and I, I, I got along with him. And, you know, he was a, a good looking guy, a handsome guy, thin, thin guy, tall, taller than me, not too much taller than me, a couple of inches taller than me, yeah. and a slender guy. And uh, he wore these dark sunglasses. And he, he, he was tough as nails. Yeah. Tough as nails. He was a killer. He was the perfect guy to handle Roy. So, you know, earlier, I'm going to give you another quick story, is that earlier there was a guy, at Roy called him, it was a Jewish kid, his, his unadopted son. Roy loved this kid. Dangerous as a rattlesnake. He did something with some Colombian guys, and he killed them and stole the money and the drugs. Yep. The Colombians came back. They wanted to know who did what. So Nino got in touch with Roy and said, listen, they're hot, these Col Colombians. They're not a joke. They're tough guys, too. And there's a lot of them. you you got to give them some hunk. you got to give them something that will back them off. They know that they were meeting this kid, the Jewish kid. I forgot his name. His name was Chris Harvey Rosenberg. Okay, that's it. That's his name, right. Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Right. He called right. himself Chris DeMeo, and that's how he got fucked up. Yeah, so anyway, he, Nino tells Roy, you got to take that kid out, and we'll tell the Colombians, he did it, we killed him, you got your hunk, it's over. That's exactly what happened. And Roy, from what I heard, killed him, but it's the only person he ever killed that he was sick over. Mm. He got sick. He really loved that kid. Yeah. And uh, so that's another story with the, the Mayo thing. So when we start doing our movies, bro, <laughs> these are going to be fucking movies that will have people with their hair standing up. So uh, no, we'll man, see no, what no. happens. And, and those guys probably know the story just as good, if not better, than I do. But I'm sure they're on the same page as I am because... Yeah. Uh, this is the way I heard these stories and knew the stories uh, firsthand. And Sammy, around that time, you know, there was a lot of talk that, you know, Dom used to say that when the con, how did it go? It was like something came down where it was like, he said, John Gotti literally said, I can't fuck with the DeMeo crew at all. These guys have got more fucking shooters than any of us. And we, we can't, we can't go near these guys. What was John... And was your crew afraid of them guys? Like, were they that dangerous that you guys even felt? No, they, they were dangerous, super dangerous. They, you know, when you start killing people for no fucking reason, that, that brings you to a different level. To me, it's not that I'm afraid of you, that you're dangerous. Everybody's dangerous. Nino was dangerous. I wasn't afraid of him. It's a lot of guys. Louis Melito, my whole crew was dangerous. Um, when, but when you're killing people that it don't make sense, he didn't break a rule, he's a nobody, he's an outsider, for stupid fucking reasons or whatever it may be, that becomes more, to me, like a serial killer. And, and yeah. it's not that I'm afraid of him, but I start to back away and I start to say, I'm not, I'm, this is a different animal. This isn't just a tough guy who's able to kill. Those are humans, so you can talk with them and you can deal with them, you can play cards with them, you can do whatever. You can argue, you can fight, you can do whatever. But with this here, this is a different animal. So it's that 
I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to expose myself to him. I don't want to get too close to him, even though I did go down quite a bit to him. And I used to see him in Jimmy Brown's club. When Paul would come, everybody would show that. So I was there. He was there. So he was so fucking crazy. He told me one time, he says, you know what we should do, Sammy? We're always together when they're talking and we're on the side. We should get a, a bench and do bench presses, work our weights. I said, are you fucking crazy, bro? Bosses are here talking. We're going to be doing bench presses in front of them? Come on, bro. That's fucking weird. I'm not doing that. You know, I worked out all my life, but I wasn't about to go in there and start pumping weights. No, we went to a meeting. Me and I was an acting captain. Louis was a made guy, Louis Melito. Mm -hmm. And we went to a meeting with Roy DeMeo and Nino. And we were talking about they were shipping cars overseas to Kuwait. They, had, they were making a ton of money. And yeah. I was trying to wiggle away to find out what they were doing. Could I do it You know, with my crew? You know, you, could you give me information how to do it? Whatever. We're talking. And that, that happens a lot of times. And uh, it looked like Roy drifted away. He wasn't listening anymore. So Louis was talking. Louis Molito was talking to Nino. And I told Roy, I said... Uh, I mean, these conversations start to get boring after a while, right, Roy? No. He said, it's good. So I said, it doesn't seem like you're paying attention. He says, no, no, I'm not. I made an appointment in a Greek diner. I knew the people. They put me in the back in a room. There was about 30, 40 people, whatever it was, 25 people, all senior citizens. So we know there's no agents, there's no nothing. We can go sit there. And we had a table in there. And he says, Just look at all these people. I said, yeah, what about him? He said, I bet you if I had two nine millimeters and pulled them out, I could kill them before they fuck even know what the fuck happened. So I said, uh, uh, yeah, probably half of them, they're in their 60s, 80s, 90s, they probably die of a heart attack. I mean, sure, they probably all die. And, uh, and then I looked at Louis Molito, I said, listen, let's come back at another time, we'll talk and this and that. So as I'm walking out with Louis, I said, did you hear what he told me? He said, yeah, about killing all the people in the room? Yeah, I heard a bit. Yeah, well, what was he talking about? I said, we're talking about shipping cars to Kuwait, stealing and making money and this, that, and the other thing. This guy's fantasizing about killing old people, bro. Something's fucking wrong with him up here. Who would do that? I mean, I, I'm a killer. I, I've killed people. I've been involved. I would never look at old people like, oh, I could kill that person in the second flat. The fuck, what the fuck kind of uh, talk is that? What kind of thinking is that? I know the guy is shot. Yeah, the guy is shot. He's in another fucking planet. So yeah. it's not that I feared him. I don't even want to be near him. I don't know. He may take a fucking uh, attitude like, Oh, Sammy didn't give me the right respect. He didn't shake my hand or he didn't walk over to me first or something and, and want to kill you for stupid reasons. Yeah. Right. So you got to take a step back with people like that. You know? Right. So yeah, it, was, it was that. I know John Gotti originally got the hit when it came time to take Roy out. Yeah. And John seemed to be a little paranoid about it. Um, and Paul picked it up. And took the contract away from him and said, forget about it. And he gave it to Frankie DeChico. And uh, Frankie called me up. He says, you're coming down to Bath Avenue today? I said, yeah. I'll catch you later. What's up? He said, I got Roy's ticket. I know what that meant. So I went down to Bath Avenue. I says, uh, you got the hit? Yeah. I said, they're all dangerous there, bro. And there's a lot of them. You need help? He said, no, Sammy, I got this. How are you going to do it? He said, I got the twins. And I told the twins, there's a contract on all of these. I'll give you guys a break. If you two guys take out Roy, I'll make sure the hit is off for you. And they did that. You think Nino went along with them for that hit? To get Roy? I have no idea. I don't, I don't think so, I, I, but I have no idea. I know that 
They took him out. We lived up to the deal. Uh, when I say we, the Gambino family lived up to the deal, that we didn't kill them. I was right. at a funeral with John Gotti and Frankie DeChico and myself and a whole bunch of people, and one of the twins was there. And he came in, and they, we took him over to John. And Gas Pipe was asking for a, re a release so he could put them with them. They weren't made. And John said, we're going to live up to what Frankie told you. There's no contract on you, and we're releasing you to Gas Pipe. And they were transferred over to Gas Pipe. And then they were there. I lost track of them. Um, I don't know what they did, what they didn't do, and what happened with, their, with them over there. The Gas Pipe is a, another half a nut. So I, I don't know. But I was there when they, they were released, and the contract was off for them. And obviously, they never got killed. Right. And, uh, and they went away for a long time. And I understand that one of them is out, and one of them is coming out in April or something like that. I read it in the paper. And uh, so that's basically all I know about, about them. What do you think about them getting out? Are you surprised? I, I was very, very surprised. But, you know... Um, anybody could change their life. I changed mine. A lot of people, they said that they still have family behind them, which is a good thing. They said that they carried themselves and changed their life in prison. You know, wardens and people, they watch you, they know. So they must have got some sort of backing with it. The only thing I think about that, I know that Bobby Manor was the concierge of the, the Genovese people. I've been, uh, I, I fight for prison reform. Um, I think he should get out. He's fucking 94 years old. He's been in prison 35, 40 years, something like that. Um, if they're letting them go, they should let him go. I think everybody deserves a chance. Um, I'm sure they've been, they did, uh, both of them did 35 years. Um, and if they have family, and they have a shot to change their, and they change their life. Um, I hope them, I wish them the best. But, well, you know, so many murders and gory murders, I was a little shocked because most of the time they don't want to let you the fuck out. Yeah. You know, you know how it is. They, they just don't want to fucking let you out. So they, they must have really impressed people how they changed their life. And uh, it happens. I listen, I changed mine. Yeah, I was just so, going to say, look at you now. I mean, yeah, you turned yeah. your life around. So there's a lot of things they could do. Uh, you know, if they ever wanted to talk to me about their life or you or whoever, it would be my pleasure to talk to them. Everybody needs a shot in life. And this is their shot. They get out. They can live. I think they were in their upper 60s, 68, 69, I, I heard. Um, they deserve a shot. You know, make some money, enjoy your family, enjoy freedom. Prison's a shithole. And I'm sure they did tough time, but they're tough guys, both of them. And uh, they, I think they deserve a shot. I hope they, I wish them success in their, you know, future, whatever it may be. Um, and who am I to say yeah, they shouldn't get out? You know, people say the same thing about me. I shouldn't get out or other people shouldn't get out. But uh, I'm in the proof, you know, I got out once, I, I recommitted for, for bullshit, and I went back. Uh, but uh, I don't hurt nobody, I don't, I have no play. Even people I don't like, I, some people I like to punch them right in the fucking face, but I don't want to kill them no more. Years ago, I would want to kill you for the same, you know, thing. But uh, I hope they uh, succeed in their life. And if their family stuck with them, they owe that to their family, they stuck with them after 35 years, they owe that to their family. They, they must be really, really good people. Yeah, I, I had only heard about Anthony Center that he really changed his life around and that he was getting out because he, he had done such good time, you know, and that he didn't cause no problems and that he was reformed in a lot of ways. So I yeah. don't know about Joey, but uh, that's what I heard about him. And, and you know, it's interesting because me and you had talked earlier I know you're you're doing some true crime stuff with some people in Hollywood. Yes. 
And, and, you know, I always, I always wanted to hear their story, right? Cause I, you know, as a guy that made a documentary film about Dominic, truthfully, you're the only guy that I've spoken to that knew him on the street, but I would have loved to hear. And I would still love to hear if, if I ever got the opportunity from those guys, what he was like in regards to the DeMeo crew. And, right. you know, so I know now I have a true. contract. That I want to let you know. I got a contract yeah. with somebody that we're going to do crime stories. So they're like, uh, season one, it's about Joe Blow, may maybe Dominic. And they'll do four, five, six, eight episodes. And then, and then when that's over, another story about somebody else. So if they ever wanted to tell, and they're going to make money, whoever comes to me and I could hook it up. Um, I'm going to make money. They'll make money if they are interested. I know I would love to do that with you, with your stories like we're talking about now and maybe do it in a series. I think we can do things. And the people who I got a contract with, they're serious people, do beautiful work. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I would love to yeah. talk with them and maybe do something for them or with them. Like I said, I wish them the best. I was in the same situation. Maybe not my crimes are as serious as theirs. I don't know. But uh, they deserve a break. They did 35 years. They paid their debt. I hear you, man. I hear you, Sammy. Yeah. If, if I have any anybody that I can connect with to get to them and get a message over them or they see this, I would definitely uh, get it over to you for sure. And I appreciate you also being interested in, in maybe doing something with me with Dominic's story because – you know, like I told you, I think uh, earlier, I swear to God, every week on my channel, people constantly sending me messages. Why isn't this a movie? Why isn't this a Netflix special? There's so much stuff in there. There's so much stuff about Dominic and his uncle, which is like a Shakespearean kind of story. The DeMeo crew, which was so unique. I mean, it just makes sense. You know what I now, mean? I became a pretty powerful producer now. And mm -hmm. you know what I see? When I see the stories, yeah. I see your story. Your story My is story. very good. Yeah, your story. What you did is, it, that, that's not a, a, an everyday story. You're a legitimate guy and a good guy. And you took in somebody and gave them a fucking shot and an opportunity to have a life. And they, he lived out his life. He died of natural causes. That's because of you. I mean, and you, got, you have a great, you're a part of that story now. You know, yeah. that's the way I would look at it as a producer. If I was going to do something, I would say, okay, we have this Dominic, Dominic story. I could add to that story. It'll be a great story. But Ross, he's got a fucking great story himself. Mm. And I, I would look at that as, as a, a, a good part of the story. I think that makes the whole story different. It's not just yeah. a shoot him up, bang him up story. It's you, you have a story yourself. Your background, your history, who you are, why you did what you did. You know, yeah. it's, a it's a beautiful thing. And I think that's a different story that people want to hear. A story of trust and love and respect and, you know, these are things that are important too. Just like I, when I'm talking about the twins there, Joey or, or the other one, um, their they're family. Their family story is beautiful. They stood loyal to him from what I understand. I don't know if it's true but stood loyal to him for 35 fucking years. God knows how many visits, how many letters, how much money they spent to help them with commissary. People don't know that part of it. Right. I think when you join the whole thing together, you know, it's wild. I mean, you know, these guys were with Roy. Um, Roy, I think, became a serial killer. And they're under him and they gotta do what they gotta do. So I don't know, you know, their story. I would love to know their story completely. I do know them. I met them a bunch of times. Um, there's people who've made up stories about them. The, 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 the Iceman said he was with them. And that's the, I think that's all bullshit. I know it's bullshit. Yeah, he was full of shit. He was full of shit. And that, you know, so people hear these stories sometimes and they think, wow, he was there too. He was a serial killer. No, he wasn't. I, I tell the story all the time. I got pinched because of him. And I know, to, I know for facts that he's a fuck, he was a bullshit artist. He killed 200 people. He killed his sister's ass he killed. 
He didn't the kill Peter Colabro thing, right? That's what you were involved with with this guy that fucking Kalinsky made all these lies about you, right? Yeah, that we killed the cop 21 years earlier. He did it for yeah. Roy DeMeo. When yeah. I, you know, when I got pitched, I said, Roy DeMeo needed him like he needed a hole in that. If he wanted to kill that cop, who was a bad cop going in back and forth with him, that guy would have disappeared <laughs> in, in two seconds, right? Yeah. So what does well, he need this yeah, fucking... He had all these shooters. What does he need this fucking Polish guy for? Right, he, this fucking bum who's a nobody. Right, so, yeah. And, and he did do one or two hits. He robbed people for fucking... One of them, I think he robbed for 15 or 1,700. Not to pay him back, he killed him. And then he put him in a, an icebox because he, he didn't even know how to get rid of the body. And then finally, when he was able to get rid of the body and the cops found the body, it didn't age because it was frozen. And, and it also had some fro frost in it. So that's right. how he got na labeled the, the, uh, the, the Iceman. Iceman, my ass. He, didn't, he was a jerk off. But the, anyway, so there, there's so many stories. And these guys fit into that story as well. Because he, I don't think so, but I think they, he used their name, Roy and, and them, that he was killing with them. He's full of shit. He literally tried to say that he killed Roy. I know. And you yeah, I know. And, and, and Frank Pergola, who's in my movie, got called in by HBO way back in the day to corroborate his story. And Frank says, the, you guys can't make a documentary about this guy. He's full of shit. Right. He goes, I interviewed him in prison. I asked him, what caliber fucking bullet? What kind of gun? What was in the trunk? He couldn't answer none of those questions. Right. No, you know, nothing. I, I talked with agents after I had cooperated and, uh, yeah. you know, after I beat the case. So they told me, they said, he said he killed Roy DeMeo. So, of course, the agents went right down to talk to him because he wanted to cooperate. He wanted to get out. He wanted to get his son out of trouble. And uh, so they said, okay, um, you killed Roy? Yes. You, you put him in the trunk of a car? Yes. That's in the newspaper. Anybody could answer that. He said, uh, what did you put on top of his body and why? He didn't have a clue. See, that wasn't released to the media. The so he didn't know what the fuck was on the body. And what was on the body was a chandelier. Yeah. So the, the agents asked me, why did they put a chandelier on him? I said, I, it's not a message. When they opened the trunk, there was probably a chandelier. They took it out. They put Roy in. They stuck the fucking thing on top of him and closed the trunk. It's right, not a right. message. It's not anything. It's put fucking... But, you know, everybody wants to have these theories. Oh, that's a, sh what, a chandelier. What, what kind of message is that? <laughs> so you put a chandelier, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was stupid. But um, yeah. uh, it's a great conversation. I'm glad we got together and talked finally. And, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you, Sammy. Appreciate it, man. Thank yeah, you my, very much. Yeah, my, my, the best to you, bro. Yeah, you too, bro. Um, hey, this was great. This was great. Yeah, you know, so let's keep Some, it going. Man. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep it going, and we'll get together, and we we can do things together. I'm sure we can work yeah. things out. You know, it, so far we're on a handshake, and it's great. It's been great, and that's yeah. important to me too. When I, you know, some guys want to, oh, let's sign a contract in three minutes. We haven't signed nothing, and and we're getting along. We talk. We're doing things now. Great. Yeah. I mean, contracts are, are important too, but we'll get to yeah. that at another time. All right, man. All right, bro. You have a great day, bro. Thanks so you, much for the conversation. You too. You too. Right. I loved it. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much.